William and Dorothy didn't come down to Grasmere in a summery day like this. It was December, the very dead of winter. And Wordsworth describes how he saw bridal water like polished steel. Immediately he wanted to get his skates out and as he says, give his body to the wind. For him, skating was a kind of freedom. But at the same time, De Quincey describes that when Wordsworth skated, it was like a cow dancing a cotillion. They'd been over the Yorkshire hills. They'd come to Kendal. They had bought furniture. Some of it would be delivered later. And so, down this hill to Dove Cottage. When William and Dorothy came to Grasmere, they came, in fact, to a hamlet, Town End, which is at the southernmost point of the village. When they came to Dove Cottage, they were coming to the principal house in this hamlet. There was nothing but a spark of fire and the beds made up. But when they looked out, they would find here there was a community. The fishers at Sightside, Molly became their servant, but John and Aggie, his wife, would work in the gardens. Over here were the Ashburners. Thomas Ashburner used to bring them coals. But they would find that Thomas had lost his land. And he was the kind of Englishman who Wordsworth felt was being neglected by the politicians. Because if he had his land, he would have his pride. If he had his pride, he would have merit, which would be valued as a national property. Wordsworth felt that that is what the politicians should be trying to preserve. We've both caught troublesome colds in our new and almost empty house, but we hope to make it a comfortable dwelling. Our first two days were days of fear, as one of the rooms upstairs smoked like a furnace. We've since learned that it is uninhabitable as a sitting room on this account. The other room, however, which is fortunately the one we intended for our living room, promises uncommonly well. That is, the chimney draws perfectly and does not even smoke at the first lighting of the fire. In particular winds, most likely, we shall have puffs of inconvenience, but this, I believe, will be found a curable evil by means of devils, as they're called, and other beneficent agents, which we shall station at the top of the chimney if their services should be required. Dorothy is much pleased with the house and appurtenances the orchard especially. In imagination, she has already built a seat with a summer shed on the highest platform in this, our little domestic slip of mountain. The spot commands a view over the roof of our house, of the lake, the church, Helm Crag, and two thirds of the Vale. We mean also to enclose the two or three yards of ground between us and the road. This for the sake of a few flowers, because it will make it more our own. This was to be the first home that Dorothy could share with her brother, her two brothers, for John was to be with them too when he wasn't at sea. Brothers that she had been separated from since she was six, except for a brief period when she lived with her grandmother in Penrith, and they came up to the grandmothers for holidays from Hawkshead School. Otherwise, Dorothy had lived away. She had, as she said later, been in grief because she had been put out of the way of many recollections with her brothers. And this was a great grief to her. She often said to her friend Jane Marshall, how we are squandered abroad. And the furnishing of the cottage, the creating of the garden, was to be a, a love and a, and a wonderment for them. While Wordsworth was away in that first spring of 1800, she went rambling on the hillside, by the lakeside, got lockety goldings, strawberries, and planted. I brought home lemon thyme and several other plants and planted them by moonlight. I rambled on the hill above the house, gathered wild thyme and took up roots of columbine. The garden was their creation as much as the house. It was their own place and their first home.